This is one on one session with the Forum IS founder and director Ayush Sinha. In this session, students are asked questions to test their preparedness for the personality test. One on one sessions are not mock panel sessions. So you are Shivam? Yes. Sir. When is the date of your interview? Uh, sir, it's on 4th of May. Shivam, can you begin by briefly introducing yourself to me? Yes. Sir, I am uh, Shivam Burnate. I belong to a district called Amravati, which is in Vidarbha, Maharashtra. I have uh, done my graduation in PLLB honors at Dr. Raman or Lohia National Law University, which is in Lucknow. Shivam, I'm afraid you are sitting far. You will have to be a bit louder. Right. Uh, sir, I have uh, finished my academic uh, graduation from uh, Raman or Lohia National Law University in Lucknow. I finished my graduation in 2020. Apart from that, uh, I am uh, very much interested in uh, following cricket and since 2020 i have been uh, preparing for uh, upsc examinations all right shivam you are from amravati in maharashtra yes amravati the name is very catchy it also reminds us of several places in ancient india what was the significance of the city amravati where was it sir uh, this name is also uh, there's a same place in Andhra Pradesh, which was supposed to be the capital. In ancient history, it is known as one of the places where Mahayana Buddhism uh, came to picture. The Amravati School of Art in Buddhism is also very famous and attached to the name of Amravati. And Satvanas and the Ikshwaku dynasty was related to the spread of Buddhism and uh, the spread of Buddhist art in Amravati. Where was this Amravati? Ancient city of Amravati? Was it, is it, was it in the same place as uh, it is right now? No, no sir, it wasn't in the same place. Sir, but I am not aware where exactly the city was. In our mythology where it is, Amravati was there in our myth, in our epics also. Sir, so from what I can recollect, I uh, only know that it used to be the uh, home from where Rukmini came. Apart from that, the mythological significance I am unaware of, sir. So you are a lawyer? Uh, yes, sir. I studied law. Yes. Tell me, Shivam, how what should be certain criteria or uh, certain qualities of a good law? Like for example, you come to know that a law has been made. So by default, there should be some some criteria on which we can judge that if these criteria are not met, then definitely it is not a good law. Sir, I think firstly a law should be clear in its wordings. There should not be a lot of ambiguity in the provisions that exist in the law. Uh, secondly, the objectives of the law and the provisions of the law uh, should be proportional uh, in regards to the national interest or the issues that are at stake. Uh, there can't be a punishment that is too harsh for a law which is not that serious or not that big an offense against the state so that test of proportionality has to exist along with that uh, for the implementation of a law there should also be a better deliberation a better discussion and uh, a be better awareness in the society to understand and to realize what the law is and so that whenever that law is violated people can go to the courts and seek their rights so I think, sir, these are some of the uh, basic tenets of what makes a good law. Without awareness. Now tell me, okay, test of proportionality. In a democracy, just apply to democracy. In a democracy, when we say that a law has been made or there is a good law, what is the essential criteria for making laws in democracy? Sir, in a democracy, the laws are made by the legislature it's the domain of the legislature so uh, the legislators which are the representatives of the people because in democracies we usually follow the representative form of government. yes so in modern times we also believe that law should be framed by a representative body yes so you said very well that it should be clear and unambiguous promotionality principle should be there no. yeah. deliberation should be there but also 
it should be through a representative body right. recently a certain member has been disqualified from his membership of the parliament because of a defamation suit uh, tell me what are the legal and constitutional laws that are involved in this disqualification Sir, legally, uh, the Representation of Peoples Act uh, 1951 is a law that is involved in this scenario. Along with that, Article 105, if I can recollect it correctly, uh, is uh, Article, yes sir, I am not uh, sure to recollect the article number, but there is a article in Constitution which also uh, talks about how a member uh, should be disqualified on the laws that are decided by the parliament. Okay, so that article is not correct. So, you know, which in which case the Supreme Court had held the RCA representation of People's Act Section 8 sub clause 4 to be unconstitutional? Sir, it was the Lily Thomas. What was the sir. argument that was given by the court? What grounds? Sir, the court had stated that. Uh, this violates the right to equality where a special treatment is given to MPs even after uh, them being convicted of an offence that uh, uh, they are not disqualified even after there being a constitutional provision which asks for their immediate disqualification. So this differentiation of sorts the court held went against the law of equality before law and the court. How does it go against equality before law? Oh, sorry sir, I could not. How does this go against equality before law? Sir, it goes against equality before law because a special three month window and then a further window was provided uh, to members of parliament till the time the But, but whom is it not provided? Uh, sir, for uh, Sir, probably for civil servants or in other cases where if you are uh, if you are convicted of a crime under Prevention of Corruption Act or other such acts. No, that is not the case. That is not the case. All right. uh, Shivam, uh, you also like to follow cricket. Yes. What is the reason that cricket became so popular in our country but uh, other sports have not been able to pick up? What got cricket so much fame? Sir, I think historically one of the reasons has to be when uh, India won the 1983 World Cup. Uh, that really struck a chord with the national uh, with the national sentiment where India had actually won and post that the broadcasting rights that uh, BCCI did get with Doordarshan and following uh, th there was a rise of celebrities in cricket players like Sunil Gavaskar player like players like Kapil Dev who uh, had a cult sort of a personality which made people then follow cricket along with that because of how comparatively easier it is to play cricket even if not in professional form you can play it in okay, so place. even has even with respect to <coughs> let's say another sport hockey we won the world cup before 1983 also 1975 we won the world cup so one is winning the world cup what else sir the amount of uh, popularity of cricket aligned with when the media started expanding, when there was a better broadcasting of the sports. Okay, compare it to football or even hockey. What makes cricket a little more popular? I'll give you a hint from geographical perspective, climate perspective. Yes, sir. Sir, so in the geographical perspective, football has uh, traditionally been a sport which needs to be played on grounds which have better grass and it is very uh, difficult in Indian condition, in the drought conditions, in the summer seasons to preserve that sort of a grass and to carry on with the practice of the sport. Uh, similarly for hockey, before the turf uh, did come, hockey was also played usually on grass. So, the logistical difficulties with the climate oh, that it gives. Yes. The main problem is with the climate. Cricket requires you to sit or stand in one place, not continuous running. But hockey and football is a continuous running game, isn't it? Yes. In a tropical country, it is difficult. Yes. Though this is not the sole criteria, but it's difficult to play that sport for long. Yes. Sir. At one point of time, with age, you are likely to give up. Yes. Isn't it? Whereas cricket can be played by even at a very higher age because it is not so strenuous. Yes. The amount of 
cardio vascular and cardio exercises that will end up doing in cricket and hockey simply be acceptable. Yes. Shivam, uh, India got the presidentship of G20. Fail to issue a joint communicate. Don't we think that G20 somehow failed? Sir, in the two previous meetings of uh, the foreign ministers and the uh, directors of banks and finance minister, there hasn't been a joint communique. But I don't think uh, that can be equated to failure of G20. Uh, G20 has primarily been a platform where uh, issues related to economy, issues related to climate, issues related to cooperation between the developing as well as the developed world are being discussed. There was an, even though there was not a joint communique, apart from the third and fourth paragraph that are being talked about from Bali declaration, there was agreement on quite a lot of issues. There is a deliberation that is being held on issues like climate financing, on issues like uh, digital governance and the emerging areas that are uh, and the emerging areas that are coming up in digital governance. So on that front, I don't think a G20 is a failure, sir. In fact, it initiates that dialogue which goes, uh, which strikes a middle path between G7, which is only for the developed countries and the UNGA where no decisions are taken because of how the system in uh, United Nations currently is. So in uh, on those lines, G20 gives India a great opportunity and gives the uh, world economies a great opportunity for deliberation and for finding uh, solutions informally through discussion, which can then be applied. How okay. can we make India a global arbitration hub. Major problem which businesses have is that in India contracts are not enforced in a good manner. You know, arbitration is a good way whenever it comes to business suits. Arbitration, in my opinion, is the best way. Then how can what steps can be taken to make India a global arbitration? Sir, I think uh, firstly the legal structure that the country does have still needs some better adaptation. Uh, there are uh, still a lot of clauses which allow for the uh, high courts and supreme courts to intervene after the awards are being given by the arbitration arm. Now, rather than just enforcing the award, which is a mandate in the law, the court ends up going into the merits of the case, which to a certain extent stops the implementation of arbitration and impedes the pace at which uh, the enforcement of contracts has to happen. So I think that that is one of the uh, flaws in the system which needs to be fixed. There has to be a better training given to courts. There have to be special benches in high courts and supreme courts which deal with uh, the arbitration laws where uh, these vagaries are understood. Along with that, I think sir, uh, there has been an establishment of international arbitration centers in India. But the amount of skill set that the Indian lawyers do have or the uh, like with the current steps that are being taken where we are allowing foreign firms to uh, where we are allowing foreign firms to practice for arbitration i think steps like that have to be initiated and have to be incentivized to ensure that uh, india resorts uh, to arbitration as a first go to process along with that there also definitely has to be uh, more and better awareness among the litigants as it should well. be what do you think should we allow foreign law firms to get into arbitration in india or should we try to promote inborn uh, domestic talent and domestic um, law firms to go for arbitration sir i think for international disputes and for uh, settling the claims with mncs uh, we should not have a blanket ban of not allowing the foreign firms because the expertise that the foreign firms do bring where uh, they've already dealt with the arbitration suits for uh, uh, for more amount of time and there has been a better research. There could probably be a middle way met where a certain amount of employment is given <coughs> to inborn lawyers who are from <coughs> India so that they can learn and acquire those requisite skills and then can independently. Shivam, uh, why do you want to join the civil services? Sir, uh, in my uh, college days and since uh, childhood, I have always been a personality who has had varied interests. And in college, through the debating that I did, I also realized, and some internships that I did, I also realized that policy making and policy implementation is something that I am pretty much inclined towards. Along with that, civil services also gives me an opportunity to create an impact in the society along with the backing by the government machinery where the government supports you where 
the certain skill sets that you have of interacting with people of knowing what are the things that are required what could be the solutions so with that sort of an inclination i think civil services would be a great avenue for me to better my personality and also to <coughs> serve the nation okay shivam uh, pc hota committee was formed among other things to make recommendations on administrative reforms so going by what you said this quota committee recommended that reforms to higher civil service will not change the experience of the people with respect to the administration of the country can you think and tell me why they said this i'll repeat they said reforms to higher civil service is going to have very little impact on the perception of the people towards the administration think and tell me why sir i think it is because of the structure of the system where the higher civil services do not have a direct interaction with people and even though there are reforms that is correct very good all right sir your interview is over